introduce Dr. Catherine Kulik, uh, who's going to talk on Catalan numbers, uh, Motskin, uh, Motskin numbers? Motskin numbers? And related sequence. Um, she's going to present the history of Catalan numbers. We have some technical difficulties here. Their connection to the Motskin numbers and their appearance in discrete calculations, emanating from an exact numerical sequence. Catalan numbers first appeared in the work of Euler, okay, in a triangulization problem of convex polygons, but have since emerged in many combinatorial problems. Connected to the Catalan sequence is the sequence of Motskin numbers and one of its generalizations. Interestingly, this is going to be a rather interesting. Uh, these well-known numbers appear in my work, in her work, I should say, on an exact numerical scheme for approximating the differential operator applied to a distance function. Uh, Dr. Kubrick uh, holds an engineering degree from, I'm going to murder the French now, the Col Nationale Superior de Technique Avancé in France. Pardon my high school French. Thank you. Pardon his French. <laughs> yeah. uh, a Master of Science in Applied Mathematics from the University of British Columbia. She received her PhD in Applied Mathematics from the University of Michigan and spent two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas. Uh, this, uh, Professional has been all over the world. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Kubik. Well, thanks very much. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, so catalog numbers and then their relationship to Motskin numbers. And then eventually I'll talk a little bit about my research. And so my research is actually not at all combinatorics. Uh, I'm an applied mathematician, so I do a lot of numerics. Um, but it, inside some of the numerics that I was doing, these Catalan numbers appeared, okay, and so then I, I'm learning all this discrete world. So, I mean, this is not my research, so I'm not an expert. So pretty much uh, all I'm telling you is what I know. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll start with the, the uh, Catalan numbers. Okay, so the, uh, in the Western world, they, they, they date back to uh, Euler in 1751. Um, so uh, in 1751, Euler, so Leonard Euler, uh, wrote a letter to a German mathematician, Christian Goldbach. So at the time, uh, people would uh, collaborate through letters. There was no internet, so no email or Skype. So people would actually write letters to each other about mathematics. Okay, and so Euler wrote to uh, Goldbach, and he told him about the problem that he was looking at. So he was looking at uh, triangulations of convex polygons. Okay, um, and so uh, we're going to talk about a convex, convex n plus two gon. Okay, so n plus two sides. Okay, the length of the side uh, doesn't matter. Okay, and by triangulations, he was looking at uh, partitioning the convex polygon as a sum of disjoint triangles, okay? And so, um, in general, if you look at a polygon that has n plus two sides, okay, the number of triangulations of this uh, convex polygon is going to be called Cn, okay? So we'll start with n equals one, okay? So this is how you, that's uh, how Euler started. He looked at examples and saw, and was trying to find a formula for Cn, okay? So if n equals one, okay, then you have an one plus two gone, so this is a three gone, this is a triangle, okay? Uh, and how many ways can I triangulate a triangle? <laughs> right, one itself, right? There's only one way of partitioning it into a triangle, it's just itself, okay? So C1 is one. And then you think about a quadrilateral. So the length of the side doesn't matter, but I'm going to draw everything with the same sides, okay? So, so I look at a quadrilateral, so here I'm just looking at a square because I'm gonna draw out all the sides have the same length. How many triangulations of, a, of the square can you think about? Two, that's right, so you can either um, triangulate this way, right, or this way. Okay, two different triangulations, okay? So that gives you uh, C2 equals two, okay? And then you, um, you just take higher numbers, you know, if you take N equals three, then it's a pentagon. How many triangulations of a pentagon? You can draw on a piece of paper, think, think a little bit about it, and you will find that there are five uh, triangulations of a pentagon, okay? And then you move on N equals four, what happens? You get 14, okay, triangulations of a hexagon, 
Okay, and then Euler went even with uh, n equals 5. This is an example that Euler computed, and you get uh, 42 triangulations. Okay, so as you can see, the numbers increase quite fast. Okay, uh, and so if you want to try and get numbers, right, uh, triangulations for higher numbers is going to take more and more pieces of paper <laughs> because you have to draw, if you have to draw all of this, it's going to uh, be long. And how do you know if you get all of them, right? Um, that's hard, okay? So, um, as I said, it, get, it gets more and more difficult as we get more sides, okay? So, um, we know now the sequence, so let's, let's look at it a little bit, okay? I just want you to be familiarized, uh, familiar with the sequence because we're going to see it a lot in this talk. Okay, so we got 1, 2, 5, 14, 42, okay? And then if you keep going, 132, 429, Right, 1,000, 4,300, uh, and then as you can see, it goes, goes up really quickly, right, really quickly. Okay, so this is the beginning of the sequence, okay? But now, of course, you don't want to keep drawing <laughs> polygons and they have to be binding, right? So in, then what you want to do is try to understand what is happening, okay, and to count these uh, triangulations. Uh, so that you can find a formula for CN, so that if I want to find the triangulations of 122 gone, I don't have to draw all the, uh, 122 gone on the paper. So um, Euler didn't have the proof, but he conjectured this formula, okay, in this paper, okay? And this is, in the Western world, this is the first appearance of the Catalan number, and I have a little star there because um, uh, from what I've, I've read, uh, there's actually a Chinese mathematician who actually did have uh, the catalog, this number in his research, and that was actually before Euler, okay? Um, but Euler did not know that. Um, okay, so then uh, Euler uh, kept working on this problem, and then he communicated the problem to uh, another German mathematician, Johann von Segner, okay? And Zegner published a paper with this recursion relation for the uh, Catalan number. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, so uh, this is recursive, right? So this is nice. You can compute it. You can implement it on a computer, and then you know, starting from C zero, you can get all of them. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a nonlinear recursion relation for these um, Catalan uh, Catalan numbers. Uh, let's kind of see, does it work? <laughs> so remember this sequence that we had, when it was uh, 1, 2, um, 5, 14, <laughs> 42. So this was uh, so the C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. Okay, so let's see if that formula works. So if I want to compute, uh, yeah, so plug in n equals 4 here, so I want to compute C5. Okay, so the formula tells me I have to sum from k equals 0 to 4 of ck, c4 minus k. So these are the, the sum expanded. So you see I have c0, c4 twice, right? The um, beginning and the end, and then c1, c3 also twice. You can combine these together, oops, like this. Okay, and then you just replace this, these ci's with their values, right? We have them. And then you get 42, okay? Oh, okay. It's pretty cool, right? Okay, and then you, you get actually C5. Okay, so how do you get this recursion relation? Well, the proof is actually not, not hard, okay? So let's try and get this recursion relation by just uh, geometry, essentially. Just look at this um, uh, convex polygon. So this is an um, n plus 3 gone, okay? An n plus 3 gone, okay? So the number, right, so I have an n plus 3 gone. Okay, by definition, the number of triangulations of this n plus 3 gone is c n plus 1, okay? By definition, right? It's n plus, right? It is n plus 1 uh, plus 2, right? Okay, so this is by definition c n plus 1, okay? So this is, has uh, n plus 3, um, uh, it has n plus 3 vertices, okay? And so uh, I start numbering them from 0 all the way to n plus 2, okay? So I have n plus 3 vertices, okay? So this is my um, n plus 3 gone, and I want to calculate the number of triangulations of this polygon, okay? 
Okay, so we're going to assume, okay, so that, you know, this is the base of the polygon. It doesn't really matter, okay? I just pick one base, okay? So this is the base, okay? And then I'm going to, so I'm coloring these two in blue, okay? Because these two points are going to be important. Okay, so I'm going to say that the number of triangulations of this polygon is the number of triangulations of this polygon that contain this triangle, okay? So you take these two blue vertices and you make the third vertex being zero, okay? That's, okay, so among all triangulations, there are a certain number of them that contain this triangle right here. Okay, the two blue points and then the zero one as the third one, okay? Plus, okay, there's a certain number of triangulations that are gonna contain this triangle now, okay? So again, the two blue and the third one being one, okay? Plus, okay, a certain number of triangulations that contain now this triangle, okay? The two blue and then the third vertex being two, and so on, okay? So the third vertex can be either zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to n, okay? So the number of triangulations, right, cn plus one is going to be the number of triangulations that contain, right, the triangle with vertex zero, plus the number of triangulations that contain the triangle where the third vertex is one, plus the number of triangulations that contain the triangle where the third vertex is two, and so on, all the way to the triangulations that will contain this triangle where the third vertex is n. Okay, so you can see that I have this sum when k goes from 0 to n, and k is the third vertex of this triangle contained in the triangulation. Okay, so you can see already I have the sum, right, from k equals 0 to n of the number of triangulations that contain the triangle with k being the third vertex. Okay? So now I'm trying to find what is the number of triangulations that contain this triangle that I drew here, okay, where k is the third vertex, okay? Well, let's see. So I have this triangle, okay, in the triangulation, so then I need to triangulate this polygon on the left, and then I need to triangulate this polygon on the right, okay? As you can see, the triangle is dividing uh, the polygon into two, two polygons on either side. Okay, so the number of triangulations that contain this fixed triangle here is going to be the number of triangulations of this polygon on the left times the number of triangulations of this polygon on the right. Okay, and okay, so let's look at this polygon on the right. How many vertex the how many vertices does it have? Well, I start from zero, one, two, three, all the way to k. So this is k plus one, and then plus this one, k plus two. Okay, what is the number of triangulations of a k plus 2 gone? By definition, it is ck. Okay, so this is the ck there. Okay, and then you can look at this other polygon here. Okay, you can count the vertices and you have n minus k plus 2. Okay, and so the number of triangulation of this um, polygon here is cn minus k. Okay, so what goes right in here, in my bubble, is ck times cn minus k. Okay, and that gives you the CN plus one. <coughs> okay, this is kind of a combinatorial um, geometry, I guess, or counting right, proof to get the formula. Okay, it has nothing, uh, yeah, so anyway, so that's how you get this recursion uh, relation. Um, okay, so with that recursion relation, uh, Euler, Goldbach, Zegner together were able to prove that indeed the number of uh, triangulations of a convex n plus 2 gon is this number, okay, the formula that he had conjectured but he hadn't proved it, okay, he hadn't proved it. He did need the, the recursion relation to actually finish the proof, okay. So it was a combined effort. So the catalog numbers, uh, we don't actually use this uh, formula, it's kind of ugly, as you can see, it's, it's big right now, really practical, so they're actually more well known uh, with this formula, so it's 1 over n plus 1 uh, times 2n choose m, or they are also um, known like this with uh, the factorials. Okay, um, they, they are actually they appeared in my research in this format, <laughs> but I didn't know they were the catalog numbers, so I did not recognize them. Okay, uh, so just wanted to look at. So do these agree with Euler's formulas? Or I mean, Euler was really big and clumsy. Can we actually reduce that to these uh, factorials or this two n choose n? So well, let's look at it a little bit. So okay, the bottom one is 
1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way to n plus 1. So that's n plus 1 factorial. The top one is, well, it's a bunch of multiplication of even numbers, but I'm skipping every second one, right? Okay, so in order for me to get factorials in there, I need to fill in the gaps, okay? So I need to, right, I'm missing the 4, the 8, the 12, okay, and then the 4n there, okay? So I'm basically multiplying top and bottom by the ones that I'm missing, okay? And then I'm doing a little bit of uh, rearranging, okay? So the first two, I write this as 2 times 1, okay? Now the 4, I write this as 2 times 2. <laughs> and the 6, 2 times 3, and so on, okay? And then uh, at the bottom, the first, the bottom four, you write it as four times one, the eight as four times two, okay, and so on. And then, when you look at this formula, you just put all the blue twos together. How many blue twos do I have? Two and of them, yeah, and how many of the blue fours do I have underneath? N of them, so this becomes two to the two N. And then the rest, if you look at the black, this is uh, 1 times 2 times 3 all the way to 2n, so that's 2n factorial, and then underneath you have n factorial and uh, plus 1 factorial. Okay, so the 2 to the 2n is 4 to the n, so those cancel out and you get that fact factorial formula. Okay, so yes, this is indeed uh, uh, what we expected. So I thought something was kind of interesting, right? Um, you know that the cn is an integer because it's a number of triangulations, okay, it's an integer. So that tells you that 1 over n plus 1 times 2 n choose n is an integer, okay, which means that if you divine, divide n plus, uh, 2 n choose n by n plus 1, you get an integer, okay, so that means 2 n choose n is actually, uh, does that mean, sorry, n plus 1 divides 2 n choose n, which is kind of cool, you can get it from knowing that all these Calor numbers are integers. Okay. Um, you may be asking, so since Euler started all of this, why doesn't it, why aren't they called uh, Euler numbers? Um, I think one of the reasons is if everything was named after Euler, we, uh, we would have too many Eulers. We wouldn't be able to distinguish. It's just, he has too many things that, uh, that have his name. So, and also, um, the, it's a Belgian mathematician, Eugène Charles Catalan, who actually did a lot of work on, the, on these numbers. And so, in, you know, the name stuck eventually. Uh, and so, they're named after him. Um, so he observed interesting things. I think I'm going to skip that. Uh, you can write cn as a difference of uh, binomial coefficients. But here's another problem, combinatorial problem, that has cn as its answer. Okay. So Catalan looked at the number of ways you can parenthesize n plus one factors. Okay. So let me give you an example. If I have two factors, well, it's just a times b. Okay, one way, n equals one. If I have n equals two, I have three factors. I can parenthesize this way. So either a times b times c, or a times b times c. Okay, that's two ways, okay? And then I have, right, look at this, one, two, okay? Then if I have four, these are the different ways I can parenthesize. Five, okay? Um, n equals four, I have uh, five factors. Okay, I did all of this. I hope it's right. I get 14 ways. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you can keep going. Okay, this is the Catalan sequence again. Okay, so this is a different uh, problem, but the answer is the same sequence. Okay, um, okay so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, two different examples, two other examples other than the triangulations that give rise to these, this Catalan sequence. So this is handshake tables, okay? So you imagine there's a, an even number of people sitting at a table, round table, okay? And we all want to shake hands at the same time, okay? But we, should, we don't want hands to cross, okay? All right, so we look at uh, two end people sitting at a round table, and the question is, in how many ways can these two end people shake hands without crossing hands, okay? You can guess what the answer is, of course. <laughs> So let's look, uh, let's look at an example. So if I have n equals 1, I have two people. In how many ways can two people shake hands without crossing hands? One way, right? Okay, this way. Uh, four people. Think about it a little bit. How many ways can two people shake hands without crossing hands? I mean, you kind of know the answer anyway. <laughs> right, two ways, this way, right? 
Is it two different ways? Okay. Um, what about uh, six people? Okay. Again, you think at it. You think about it hard. You will get five. Okay. These are the five different ways they can shake hands without crossing hands. Okay. And then if you keep going, it's going to get to 14. Okay. Eight people. You can again. You can draw these things, and then you can convince yourself that yes, indeed, I'm getting 14. Okay. All right. We get the Catalan sequence again. So, uh, another example is dig paths, okay? So this, uh, in this example, um, I want to draw mountains, okay? So I start at the sea level, okay, horizon. Okay, I want to draw mountains with N upstrokes and N downstrokes so that I never go below the horizon and I end back, I, I have to end up at the horizon again, okay? So, Let's see, n equals 1. So I have one upstroke, one downstroke. How many ways can I draw a mountain? So at the beginning, the first one has to be an up, right? Because otherwise, if I go down, I go below the horizon, right? So the first one, I have to go up, OK? And then after that, I have no choice. I have to go down, right? So only one way, OK? This is the mountain. Now two, well, again, you think about it. I could do either up, up, down, down, or up, down, up, down, right? Two ways. Okay, these are the two mountain ranges. Okay, um, n equals three. Okay, so again, you, have, you think about it a little, a little hard, and you get five. Okay, these are the five possible mountain ranges. Okay, and then uh, if you have four, it gets a little bit more complicated, and then you can convince yourself that you do get fourteen. Okay, and so again, the Catalan sequence. Okay, the Catalan. <coughs> now, are these problems all the same? Well, the answer is the same, right? The CN, the Catalan sequence, so likely they are uh, the same. They are equivalent problems, OK? So what I want to do is, um, so in math, the way we can show that two things are the same is uh, to uh, construct a bijection between two problems, OK? So that means from one, I can get to the other, and then from the other, I can get back to the, the original one, OK? So I can go both ways, OK? In a unique way, in a unique way. Okay, so I want to show you a, a, a cool bijection between handshake tables and uh, dig paths. Okay, so I'm picking uh, a configuration here of handshake tables, okay, with six people, okay, and I want to construct a dig path from that, okay. So I'm going to require the help of a little bug, okay, so this is a little bug, okay. It's going to start here at that position, okay. And then it's going to start walking around the edge of the table, okay? And as it walks around, okay, when it sees the beginning of a handshake, it's going to shout up, right? And when it sees the, uh, the end of the, the closing of a handshake, it's going to shout down, okay? Okay, so it starts, it starts, um, oh yeah, sorry. So imagine, right, what is it? Up, down, down, up, up, down, down, okay? So that gives you this mountain range, okay? In a unique way, okay? And there's a unique way, okay? A unique mountain range. Um, so this is a different configuration, you can probably guess, okay? So it starts moving. Uh, no, that's, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be down. It has to be, yeah, it has to be up. So now I'm confused. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it can't be down. So. No. Like if just being start up. Being in the handshake is the first time you see that handshake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what it is. I'm sorry, that's what it is. The first time you see, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, this is exactly what it is. I said it wrong. It's the first time you see the handshake, you say up. And this, it, it was the second time you see that handshake, right, you say down. Exactly. That's how it is. So you, this is the first time you see that handshake, so you have up. So it says this is up, up, down, up, down, down. Yeah. There you go. Um, okay, so then um, can we reverse this process, right? So now I want to construct the bijection the other way. So now I give you a mountain range. I want to create these handshake tables, okay, in a unique way. So again, I'm invoke. I'm, I'm going to take uh, get the help of this little bug here, okay? And it has to start at the same time for all of them, okay? Otherwise, if 
you know, it wouldn't be the same bijection otherwise. Okay, so it has to start at the same place uh, uh, all the time. Okay, so it's going to start there again. Okay, so when it says up, it's going to uh, create a, a handshake. Okay. So it says, well, this is the first time I'm seeing a handshake. So there's going to be a hand that that does that. Okay, reaches out. Okay, so it's up. Okay. So there's a hand that reaches out, okay? Then it's another up. So there's another hand that reaches out, okay? And then it's down, so it knows that it has seen one of these handshakes before, okay? So I have to close one of these handshakes, okay, with this third person, okay? So then there's two options. Either the third person shakes hands with number two, or the third shakes with number one, okay? But if the per third person shakes hands with number one, there will be a crossing hand, okay? So that is not possible. So that means three has to shake hands with two, okay? And there's a, just a unique way, okay? And then it keeps going, so what did we do down? So now it's up, so there's a, another hand that uh, shake, you know, <laughs> extend your, the hand, and then a down, down again. So the then down, it knows that it has seen the handshake before, okay? So it can either, uh, so this is one, two, three, four, five shakes hands with uh, four or with one, okay, and again, if uh, five shakes hands with one, it's going to cross hands, so that is not possible, so it has to shake hands with four, and so it has to be uh, this way, okay, and that's a unique way to get to these um, handshake tables. Um, okay, so now what about the triangulations? Getting back to the triangulations, are these handshake tables the same as the triangulations that Oro was looking at? So. To show that they are the same here, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm not going to construct a bijection. I'm going to show that the answer to the problem satisfies the same recursion relation as the triangulation, the numbers. Okay. So again, so I'm going to look at 2n plus 2 people sitting at a round table, right? So cn plus 1 is the number of ways these 2n plus 2 people can shake hands. Okay, so here are these are my two n plus two people. Okay. Um, okay. So, how do I count these guys? Okay. So it's going to be the number of ways these people can shake hands without crossing hands is the number of ways these people can shake hands such that person one shake hands with person two. So first of all, um, person one. If you look at person one, it can shake hands with two, four, six eight, and so on. Only even numbers, because otherwise if it shakes hands with three, then when two tries to shake hands, it's going to cross hands, okay? So person one can only shake hands with, uh, sorry, yeah, even, even numbered people, okay? Even numbered people. So then I say, okay, well, the number of ways these people can shake hands is the number of ways these people can shake hands so that one shake hands with two plus the number of ways they can shake hands such that one shakes hands with four, plus the number of ways they shake hands such that one shake hands with six, and so on, right? So one can shake hands with two, there's configuration with that, with four, with six, with eight. Okay, all the way to two n plus two, okay? So, in how many, well, in how many ways can people shake hands such that one and two shake hands? So one and two are already shaking hands, how many, how many people left over? 2n, okay, how many ways can 2n people shake hands without crossing hands? Cn, Cn, right, so that's the first hand, right? This guy is with 1 and 2 shaking hands. Now, suppose 1 and 4 shake hands. Now what happens to 2 and 3? They have to shake hands, right? They have to shake hands, okay? So this is one way two and three can shake hands, okay? And then how many people do you have left over? Two and minus two, right? And how many ways can two and minus two people shake hands without crossing hands? Cn minus one. So this is Cn minus one. And the C1 is how many, in how many ways can these two people, what, two and three shake hands without crossing hands? Okay, and then you can see the pattern. Let's, let's do one more, right? So now one and six are gonna shake hands. So in, in the middle here, you have four people. Right? Two, three, four, five. And how many ways can these four people shake hands? That's C2, okay? And the rest is 2n minus 4 people, so this is Cn minus 2. So then you get Cn minus 2 times C2, and then so on, okay? And you get, uh, you can go all the way, and then you get this was the exact uh, same recursion relation, okay? So they are the same as the triangulation. 
which is why the answer is the same. Okay. All right, so this is uh, all the different few examples that give rise to the Catalan sequence. I believe there are like 80 <laughs> so <laughs> examples. There's a book that, uh, from Stanley that lists all the different combinatorics examples that give rise to uh, the Catalan sequence. It's kind of amazing. Um, so I, I'm done with examples. So now I'm going to talk about generating functions. So a generating function is a nice tool to study sequences. Okay, this is a, something mathematicians do to study a sequence. Okay, they look at the generating function. So it's a way to go from the discrete world to a continuous world, and then you can do uh, tools of calculus and you know things in the continuous world to get results for the discrete world. Okay, so. It's actually quite clever. Okay, so here, a uh, generating function is uh, basically a uh, Maclaurin series. Okay, and basically you take the coefficient of x n to be c n. Okay, uh, so here that's the sequence. Okay, so this is the first few terms of this generating function, and it turns out that this generating function has a closed form. Okay, so this is this is very nice. Okay, and why? Okay, so um, if you look really hard at this term on the right, this guy. This is a Cauchy product. Okay, this is a Cauchy product. And where do you get a Cauchy product? When you multiply polynomials together, or when you multiply series together. Okay, this Cauchy product here, because this is CK and this is basically C and minus K, right? This is the same coefficient, just translated. That that would that arises when you multiply P with itself. Okay, so this is P times P. This is P squared. Okay, so when you square P and you use the recursion relation you get that it satisfies this equation. It's algebraic. It's really nice. It's quadratic even in P. So a quadratic formula, you get the answer. Now, of course, there's plus or minus, right? There's two roots. So there's one that's not going to be feasible, right? The P here uh, is finite at 0, OK? So when you do the quadratic formula, you get two formulas, one that blows up at 0 and one that doesn't, OK? So you have to pick the one that doesn't blow up at 0, because obviously that does not blow up at 0. Okay, and so you get this very nice closed form. This is just um, the quadratic formula, right? And then you get this closed form, which is really, really cool, I think. Uh, um. Okay, so from there, um, I discovered the Mutzkin numbers, okay? So here are the Mutzkin numbers. They're related to the Catalan numbers this way. So this was defined um, in 1948 by uh, T. Mutzkin, okay? And he looked at this sequence of numbers, okay? This new sequence of numbers, MN, okay? And as you can see, this is CK, right? The Catalan number, okay? And then you get this uh, binomial coefficient in front, okay? And then this is the uh, integer part of N over 2. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit of why uh, why that is, okay, what that counts. But what I want to point out is that MN satisfies two very different recursion relations, which I think is fascinating. The first one is linear in MN. Second order, linear in MN. Hmm. The second one is highly nonlinear in MN, okay? This is like the Catalan recursion relation with the sum of C and C and minus K. It's Catalan type, yeah? A little bit more complicated, but it's Catalan type. Okay. So what is the interpretation of Watskin number? So uh, it's related to handshake tables uh, and dig paths, actually, okay? So the easiest way to describe it here is, is the number of ways of connecting a subset of n points on a circle with non-intersecting chords. Okay, non-intersecting chords is the non-crossing hands that we were looking at before. Okay. Okay, so now I'm looking at just instead of points on the circle, you can think of people. Okay, I have n people. Now I don't have to have an even number of people because they don't all shake hands at the same time. Right? Maybe a subset of them are going to shake hands. Okay. So it's, it's okay if I have three people, then only two shake hands, okay, so it's fine. Okay, so uh, for three, this is the number of ways a subset of three people can shake hands without crossing hands, okay? So maybe I have zero people cross hands, shake hands, okay? That's one configuration. Or I have two people shake hands. There's three different ways these two people can shake hands without crossing hands. So that's four, okay? Okay, four ways. What about n equals uh, 4? So now I have 4 people. Uh, well, either none of them shake hands or 2 of them shake hands. 
in that case have six different ways two people can shake hands without crossing hands. And then if four of them cross hand, uh, shake hands, that would be uh, these two ways. Okay, so in total that gives you nine ways. Okay, okay in general, and uh, I want you to see where the formula comes from. Okay, so mn, okay, this is the number of ways n people can shake hands. Well, sorry, number of ways a subset of n people can shake hands without crossing hands. Okay, so either I have uh, zero people shake hands, or two people, or four, or six, or 2p, okay, it has to be an even number of people shaking hands. Okay, 2p, but this p has to be the integer part of n over 2, okay, because n is not necessarily an even number, okay. So now let's look at some k, okay? In how many ways can 2k people shake hands among n without crossing hands? So first I have to choose these 2k people out of n, right? So it's going to be that how many ways can I choose 2k people out of n? This is the n choose 2k, right? I have to choose these 2k people first. And then once I have these 2k people, in how many ways can 2k people shake hands without crossing hands? That's the ck. Okay, so this is the n choose 2k times ck, okay? So this is uh, what I'm saying here, right? It's the number of ways we can choose 2k people out of n times the number of ways 2k people can shake hands without crossing hands, which is the ck, okay? And so this is the, uh, this is why the formula is what it is, okay? <clears throat> so another way of uh, looking at Mutskin, um Numbers, one, another interpretation is a Mutskin path. So this is a generalization of the dig path that I talked to you about before. Okay, so in, in this case, um, I'm, again, I'm starting at the horizon, but I can do uh, steps up, steps down, and then horizontal steps also. Just a little bit more variety of steps, okay? So here, okay, let's say n equals four, and how many ways can I um, go from 0, 0 to 4, 0, okay, on the, on the real line, with, you know, up steps, down steps, and horizontal steps, you get 9, okay, which is the same as the, uh, uh, the way 4 people, a subset of 4 people can shake hands without crossing hands, okay? So these are the examples of paths that you can have. Okay, all right, so it's getting a little closer to uh, my research, okay, things that appeared in my research. In 2014, so super recent, uh, Sun defined a generalized Mutsky number, okay? So there are, there are lots of generalization of Catalan numbers, okay? And I'm not talking about them for the reason that they are not in my research, okay? So I haven't invested the time to learn about these generalizations. There are actually many of them, okay? There's tons of ways you can generalize these Catalan numbers. So don't ask me questions about that because I can only tell you there are many different ways and that's it. <laughs> but this one actually up here, okay, uh, is uh, useful. So this is one generalization of the Motskin number, okay? There actually, I know of one other generalization which I don't think is the same, okay? Um, so I'm not exactly sure how he came up with that, to be honest, but it's actually very useful for me, okay, that he generalized it this way, okay? So he basically added two parameters, so the A and B, and he made them be integers, okay? Um, and so this is the n to 2k, ck, and then he has the n to the n minus 2k and bk. Why is it n minus 2k? Well, um, you want uh, the power of a to be uh, positive, okay? So if you do n minus 2k, it's going to be uh, a positive, uh, sorry, an integer, I wanted to say well, integer. And it's going to be integer, um, uh, yeah, because basically uh, you want, well, no, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, what, am I, what do I want to say actually here? I want to say, po I think positive, yeah, because 2k has to be less than n because you're picking 2k out of n, right? So you want 2k, yeah, n minus 2k to be positive, I think. I think. Uh, uh, that's why. I'm not exactly sure why he's, uh, he's that's just generalization, but it's actually, uh, you'll see this appear in later on in what I'm trying to do, and there's a very good reason why I have the n minus 2k for me, okay, more so for that for him. But anyway, okay, so he's looking at that, okay, as you can see it is a generalization of the Motskin number because if you pick A and B to be 1, you do get the Motskin number, 
Okay, so it is a generalization. And then he was able to calculate the generating function for this crazy Mudskin, generalized Mudskin number. Okay, so this is the generalization, the, its generating function. Okay. Okay, so uh, you'll see that again because that appears in, my, in what I'm trying to do. Okay. So now I want to go to what I'm doing. Okay. So I will skip all of this. This is actually coming from numerics. Okay. But numerics is my research. Okay. So I had this numerical scheme that I was looking at to approximate some uh, differential operator applied to a very specific function. It was the distance function, and I'm going to skip the detail of why I was trying to do that. Okay. Uh, it would take too long to explain, but. I realized, so when I was coding it up, the scheme was exact, okay, which in numerics doesn't happen. I mean, usually it has some sort of error that you're making, okay, it's usually either quadratic or cubic, but this has, in, this had infinite order. It was, it was, I was getting machine precision, which was very strange. I was very, so then I ended up, you know, doing Taylor series, trying to understand you know, what is the, the error and then getting that everything in my Taylor series was zero. Every coefficient was zero. And inside this are the Catalan numbers and the Mudskin numbers that contribute to all these coefficients being zero, okay? Which is kind of uh, this fascinating thing. But inside the calculations, I have this very interesting sequence that appears, okay? Now, I want to emphasize the fact that my sequence is doubly indexed as opposed to everything I've talked about so far, right? Everything I talked about is a sequence of one integer, right? It depends on n, that's it, okay? And the a, even in the generalized Matskin number, he is looking at mn and a, b are parameters, okay? Yeah. Okay, it is not a sequence in a and b, okay? It's only a sequence in n. Mine is actually a sequence in n and k, and you can see very clearly from the recursion relation that it's recursive in n, but recursive in k as well, right? So it's like a, uh, it's a partial difference equation, right? Like partial partial differential equation, when right? you have two variables, this is a partial difference equation when I have two indices, okay? So it's, very, it's a little different than what people have. But it is linear in gamma, okay? That's one thing I want you to notice, it's linear in gamma, a little bit like the Motzkin sequence that was linear, and had, it had a linear recursion relation. Okay, so this appeared, I was able to solve it. Uh, oh, so this is just, I was showing you a little bit of the numbers, and the triangle didn't show up very nice, so. I don't know how to fix that in late time, but so, anyway. I was able to solve this sequence, <laughs> this recursion uh, relation, and get a closed form for gamma and k, okay? So as you can see, so outside of this negative one-fourth of the k, I get the uh, summand of the Matskin number, okay? So they're related. And then I was also able to show that it also satisfies this very complicated or very nonlinear recursion relation, which is a very Mutskin type as well, right? Okay. Of course, I have a double sum because I have two indices. Okay. So I have to have this double sum. I haven't figured out the, the, the one quarter there. What, what is the origin of this one quarter? I'm not exactly sure yet. But anyway, so I was able to show that. And so the final thing that I want to show you is generating function for this gamma. Okay, so I have the sequence of gamma. So a good thing that you do is find generating functions for these the sequence. Okay, so when you have a doubly indexed sequence, okay, your generating function has had to, has, has to have two variables x and y. Okay, so now it's a function of two variables. Okay, and so this is the how you define the generating function. So here. So x, so k starts from 0 to infinity, and n has to be bigger than 2k, remember? Okay, uh, because I have this n choose 2k, right? So I have to pick 2k people out of n, <laughs> right? So I have to have n bigger than 2k, okay? Otherwise, I can't do that, okay? So this is why my n starts at 2k, okay? I fix our k, and then n has to start at 2k. So then, what is the power of y? Okay, so here's the n minus 2k. This has a very particular re reason why I did this, is because I want my very first term in y to be y to the 0. Okay, so when I take n equals 2k, I want to have y to the 0. Okay, and so that's why I have to subtract 2k, so that I have y to the 0 when I, when I take n equals 2k. Okay, so this is why I have this n minus 2k there, and then the x is just to the k. Okay. Now I can switch the order of the sums. Okay, great, I do that. So now I get this uh, finite sum inside, okay? 
then I replace gamma with its expression, okay? And then in the end, I get this. Okay, now remember the generalized Matskin number. This is where I write. I mean, so I have n choose 2k, ck, and then something to the k, and something different to the n minus 2k. Okay, that's this. That's the generalized Matskin number right there, okay? Except my a is uh, y, and my b is negative x over 4, right? Okay, so it's actually, right, this is the boom, the generalized Matskin number, n and y, negative x over 4. So, okay, so I can replace this sum inside by just this mn, okay? So now I have this sum, okay? Now go back to the generated function for this Amatskin, right? I basically, I'm summing mn a b, right? So this is this generating function when x is 1, okay? When x is 1, so I can calculate, okay, just replace x to be 1 here. Okay, there you go, that gives me my generating function, okay? So, again, my, my a is y, and the b is negative x over 4 here, okay? So just replace, you get a generating function, okay? So I was able to calculate the generating function of my sequence using this tool that I learned not a long time, that I learned um, not a long time ago, okay? Um, so this is kind of where I'm at. Um, I do want to point out that um, Matskin only generalized these numbers for AB integers, and for me, X and Y are real, okay? And so there remains to be shown that uh, this actually works out for real numbers, okay? So that is uh, something that I, ha I still have to do. Uh, so this is my last slide, just want to kind of summarize uh, what I did. Um, um, yeah, so I discussed Catalan Matskin, uh, and then I have this really fascinating sequence that appears, which is related with these nice sequences, and you know, still a little bit of work uh, to be done to show that this works for real numbers. Um, so these are my references uh, that interest you, and then I thank you very much for your attention.